Prior to this uh, meeting, I went on a, on a moose hunt, so I spent most of my time getting ready for that, and my presentation was actually kind of boring after watching everybody's yesterday. This morning I got up and uh, was downloading some pictures and putting some things on it, trying to add a little bit of zest to it, I guess, you know, and uh, uh, as far as the moose hunt went, uh, zero. I tried to do my best to uh, help call the moose population up in northern Alberta, but did not accomplish that. Ah, uh, the 17, we got to the zero. Right there. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I do want to thank uh, the two previous speakers for uh, allotting me their extra time. Let's see if we can make this work here. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, for those who don't know me uh, or haven't a chance to read the bios. Um, I have a deer farm myself in uh, Turtle Lake, North Dakota. I've been ranching deer for 19 years here in uh, January. It will be uh, 20. I've sat 14 years on the North Dakota State Board of Animal Health. Uh, I think 10 plus years, 12 years now, I guess, on the U as a director of the U.S. Animal Health Association with uh, Dr. John Fisher, uh, the state veterinarians, uh, Dr. Avery Um I sit on the advisory board for the uh, North Dakota State Diagnostic Lab, as well as the uh, Homeland Security's uh, CZAD, uh, Center for Excellence of Emerging Zoonotic Animal Diseases, based out of Kansas State University. So um, I've been involved, I guess, in, uh, in animal health or regulatory end of it uh, for going on 20 years now. And uh, that's my claim to knowledge. I don't claim to be an expert. I'm no doctor. I'm no veterinarian. Uh, but I uh, just kind of learned everything in a school of hard knocks. So make sure you get the right one here. I want to talk. I want to thank uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, so uh, I wasn't around much, as I said. Uh, I've been farming deer now for going on 20 years. Uh, the day my oldest daughter Savannah was born is the day I bought my first deer. So uh, I've been on the run ever since, and I wasn't home to, to, to read all the books and sell the nursery rhymes to my kids. And uh, yeah, I got to admit, uh, my mother didn't do that to me either. And uh, I, was, I was home with my or out with my father hunting, and I never got to hear him. But at least now, I know why they're making all that extra noise when we're on the way to the bear stand and on the way back. You know, the, these funny little sounds they've been making uh, of all these years have really bothered me. And but uh, I, 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 some, I might write a book to uh, eliminate that. Well, New nursery rhymes. Uh, I thought I should start with why I'm here, you know, and, and, and why is there deer farming? Um, I know last night at the supper, uh, maybe there's been some contention around it or maybe uh, in, in discussion on it. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Farmer's Bulletin 330. But President Teddy Roosevelt directed uh, at the time uh, Secretary... Ag Secretary James Wilson, and uh, from the previous, I guess, prior to the USGS, uh, it was about the Chief Biological Survey. Um, just, my eyes are no good as I get older. Anyway, directed them to uh, to explore deer farming, and they published Farmers Bulletin 330 to help direct the states to expand and explore deer farming, to make the sale of venison um, possible, to allow for the privatization and sale of, uh, of deer and elk. So if you uh, are looking for some neat reading, just Google Farmer's Bulletin 330. Really easy to get to. Uh, and, and it explains what Teddy Roosevelt's thoughts were and why he started this back in 1908. Um, the neat thing as you read it, it'll talk about farms that they researched and went back to into the 1800s. People that were doing it already 15 and I think they weren't even 40 years prior. So uh, some really neat information in there. And uh, like I say, that's just kind of what, you know, what started where we're at today. Uh, why we care about CWD. For many, of this, for many of us in this room, it is our job or passion to care for animals and the environment. With no previous sampling prior to 1996, no one really knew the prevalence of CWD throughout North America. I applaud those of us in this room that uh, had the intestinal fortitude to act quickly in hopes of containing what they felt was a newly emerging disease. I think now is time to step back and reevaluate those decisions. You know, it's, uh, we've been doing this, like I said, going on over 20 years, and um, I think it's time we readdress a, a few things, you know. Why we care about CWD, fear of the unknown, you know. 
with no, uh, hang on, I'm going to slide behind. I apologize for that. Why we care about CWD, basic animal husbandry. You know, from the farm servant industry standpoint, you know, it's what we do. We take care of our animals. I can't make a living with the dead ones. You know, they got to be live, healthy animals to, uh, to be profitable. Challenges that we face, you know, uh, there are still states that allow unregulated movement of 100 kill carcasses. Um, you know, people disposing of carcasses in my backyard, my back 40, down my section line. Um, it, it, is, it is a risk. It is a threat. Uh, they all fell off in the grains and the voles. Uh, I'll put up some pictures here later on, and maybe I should. And then uh, sporadic occurrences, a relationship to scrapie. You know, their scrapie was, was widespread throughout this country, and, uh, and a lot of the areas that have heavily, you know, are heavy with CWD now were heavy with scrapie years ago as well. Is there a relationship, you know? You know, possible. Uh, waiting on these updating the federal CWD, CWD program. It seems that that is always a, a never-ending thing. And then this urine-based scent bans being proposed by a lot of the different states. Um, the environmental contamination from uh, the carcasses is real. You know, and, and it ain't just the carcasses, but the taxidermy trade. I think right here in Michigan, your very first CWD case. Uh, it was only one case net heard, but if I remember that right, that individual was a taxidermist. And he had a freezer, a freezers full of heads from all over the country. And uh, if I remember right, he was prosecuted for that, and uh, and we support that. So, but it's something that's definitely real. Uh, movement of other infectious materials, such as hay, we've seen that today. I don't want to cover a lot of stuff, but you know, it isn't just a movement of hay to those cattle producers out there, but movement of hay into my into my pens. And I know in Wisconsin, one of the latest farms that had got CWD in the last couple of years outside of the CWD zone and double fenced, everything, doing everything right. Uh, it's what they're actually looking at because here he was sourcing his alfalfa from within the CWD zone. And that's actually my daughter, Savannah, making hay there. Uh, last year, or this past winter in that alfalfa field, when I went out that last winter because we had snow, you know, this deep, I counted 10 different carcasses, deer carcasses out on that in that field. And I remember this, you know, saying this spring, I ought to go pick them up so I don't get the horns through the tires and, you know, the bones in my bales and everything. And by the spring, the coyotes had them pretty much cleaned up. But as we did make hay, you know, I did notice, and you can't see it when alfalfa is that tall, but there were spots that as I went over and I come around the next windrow that, you know, there's still pieces and bones and chunks of hair, you know, and, and I don't know how removed from animal agriculture you are, but that's real. You know, and, and we take this to the next level, not only that carcass that was there, and I apologize, this blank spot, there's supposed to be a bale there with a badger bailed up in it. I don't know how many of you have seen on Facebook lately that one with the fox bailed in there. I couldn't find that one, but I did find one with a badger in it, but it was too big and I couldn't get it uploaded in time. But but we bail up all types of things. You know, when you make ditch hay, I've bailed up logging chains and beer bottles and beer cans. I mean, we bail up anything that's in front of that baler, it will pick up. Um, in this particular instance, you know, this year, when I knocked all my hay down and then we got a rain, so I wasn't able to get it picked up in time. So I had to go out there with a rake and flip my windrows over. And we heard of studies last, you know, uh, yesterday about the dust and, you know, and, and the infection, you know, effectivity of this dust. And we heard about the, you know, the transmission of CWD in this nasal, the connection to the nasal passages. We know that this, that the plants can uptake the prions. But it gets back to maybe like the urine thing, you know, does it, how much does it have to be amplified? How infectious really is it? What is an infectious dose? How much, how many pounds of this hay need to be, need to be consumed? It's probably a lot. But I think what more of the issue is, what needs to be studied is, what about every time I run over a molehill or a volehill? You know, I'm telling you, anybody that's made hay, anybody that's run one of these dang mower conditioners knows what that's like when you hit that molehill and it slugs up and you spend the next 20 minutes digging that out of there, you know, but, you know, the ones that don't slug it up, that hay, that dirt goes right through, right into the, right into the windrow with everything else. And when you come along bail it, you, know, you bail it up. This year now when I had to, I had to go out there and flip it over with that rake. When you're raking, them, them fingers are ground, going into the dirt. They're digging into the dirt the whole time, flipping that dirt up into that bale. So I really question, what about when that, when that deer now, or for whether you sell this bale across state lines or, or across the country and to a cattle producer, and then that winter, wild deer, wild elk come in there and eat out of it, or if it's a deer farmer, myself, that has that bale or, you know, brings that bale in. And them deer, they stick their nose. You ever look at a bale that a deer have ate on, 
you know, it gets these little holes in it. They get just bigger and bigger. You know, they, you know, they don't eat it or tear it apart like a cow or a, or a horse. You know, they, and they'll be in their eyeballs deep. And they're inhaling the whole time they're in there, you know. So what is going on with that dust that's in that bale, that dirt that's in that bale going straight into that nasal cavity, you know. So just a, a challenge that we face that I think the industry, I think the, uh, the wildlife community needs to explore as well, too. I, I don't know what the answer is, what the fix would be. But, uh, you know, when we're looking to, you know, to point fingers or to, you know, to, to try to figure out, you know, some of the epi on this and why it's spread and how it's spread into some of these new areas, it's definitely got to be a factor we consider. The sporadic occurrences, every TSE, every TSE other than CWD has a spontaneous form. Most of your leading TSE researchers will tell you they think CWD does it as well. I don't know why it's not widely accepted, but I think it's also something that needs to be looked at, you know. Um, and we already discussed too that close relationship between scrapie and CWD. Some of our other challenges, uh, Dr. Nichols hit on it, this chronic waste or the uh, CWD program. Most states, as, uh, as Michigan is, my own home state is North Dakota as well, you know, can be either Department of Agriculture or the DNR or a combination of both. And, you know, the federal rule, I think, is what ties them all together. That's our one common ground that we have that hopefully everybody's abiding by the same level so that hopefully we are preventing any uh, any problems? This urine-based scent bans. Um, the urine industry, while it isn't a lot of producers that partake in this, uh, from a financial standpoint, it's unreal. I mean, and it's so big that it's tough for us to get our hands around it. It's also probably one of the most secretive industries in the world. Nobody wants to share their secret as to how do they collect it, how do they preserve it. You know, and, and how do they do the individual animal, whatever. And so it, it is a tough industry, you know, for, for me to get into. But I got into it eight years ago, or going on now, it's probably 10 years ago, and was able to get to that industry and get them all assembled and tell them, hey, it's looking like urine's a possible cause of, you know, spread of, of, of CWD. How many of you are in the certification programs? And there were some that were, there were a lot that weren't, you know. and. Um, so I told them, I said, hey, here's your warning, you better start. And I'll tell you, they stepped up to the plate and they started. And when it finally surfaced, you know, many years later here in the re last recent years, um, those herds were certified. And I can tell you to this day, of all the, of the 85 positive facilities we've had in this country, not one of them collects urine or sells urine. So. It's not the source. It's not, you know, if we're on a witch hunt to, to see what, how did all this move around here, how did it get to Norway, you know, I, I don't think it's the urine industry, you know. Uh, do we want to have safeguards installed? Do we don't, yes, for sure. I applaud that urine industry, that scent industry, for going above and beyond. They worked with the Archery Trade Association. Uh, Dr. John Fisher helped make some recommendations, and they went above and beyond the federal requirements to implement further restrictions to make sure that. If or when it did happen, the product, you know, would be the, as safe as possible and when, when it spread CWD around. So um, it needs to be regulated. We need to look at it. But outright bans, I, I think, are way, way, way more things that we need to address before we get to this. You know, I think it's uh, from a hunting community, you know, a hunter myself, I would hate to lose, the, lose that tool. How many people were at, uh, you, I should have asked this earlier, you know, but uh, how many people were out in Utah for the, the CWD symposium, the very last one that we had? And while we're doing it, let's keep rolling here. Dr. Williams got to do this, so I will too. Uh, how about uh, who was in uh, Wisconsin? At the, uh, was it in Madison that we held that at? Who was in the Wisconsin CWD symposium? Okay. For the old timers, who was in Denver in 2002? Yeah, I've managed to make them all. But uh, anyway, Mike Miller in, in Utah said uh, CWD is widely distributed and likely underestimated. You know, and, and it gets back, we already talked about the, the prevalence levels and the, and the surveillance systems we have. Uh, Dr. Fisher talked on these, uh, like, you know, people using these prevalence charts, you know, statistical charts, these 95 fives, 99 ones. You know, them charts weren't designed for free ranging populations you know, of unknown, of unknown populations. You know, they're designed for a cattle feedlot of a known number. And I think, 
in Arkansas is probably the perfect uh, example that the, 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 the surveillance systems we have today are flawed. Um, the last speaker here, uh, Dr. Richards, put up a, a, a had a, and I'll get to it, I guess, your next one. You know, if we look at the map, you know, and you look at those ones in far Wisconsin, I think the statement was made that, you know, there's no positive, no wild positive deer around there, you know, and well, with the surveillance systems we have, do we really truly know that? What had, What is the surveillance numbers from around them herds, you know? Do we really know what truly is the source into those farms? The, the deer farms are the canary in the coal mine on this thing, you know, and I'm not saying we can't spread, these, you know, spread disease. I'm not saying we can't move disease. Uh, it was pointed out before, uh, a lot of these movements, those ones early on, and I don't know how the Toronto Zoo ever got removed from the map. That still blows me to this day that nobody will add it back on there. But for some reason, the Toronto Zoo was, was removed. But I also think if we're going to remove the Toronto Zoo, why don't we remove, remove Montana, Oklahoma? Um, you know, there's, there's many other ones that are going on 19 years, you know, and not another case. So how relevant is that dot really to there, you know? And there's many other instances. I should have had that uh, map that Dr. Richards had up that show, you know, prior to all these here, where that first initial wave when we moved, there were herds traced all over the country. So the trace out system did work in that instance. Then we're from non-certified herds. Then we're from herds that had never even heard the acronym CWD before. So at that time, they traced them all up. But the neat thing is, if you look at a lot of those, and a lot of those dots are, the, you know, the ones in northern Minnesota, the ones, some of those in northern Wisconsin, a lot of those dots to this day don't have CWD around them. So, and what's neat about being in the industry as long as, you ha as I have and the work we've done with our registry system, and I know the 85 farms that had CWD. It's personal, you know, and I know those people. I know when they lose their livelihoods. But part of the doing that or knowing that is I know when they're gone now out of the industry for five years I know who they sourced their animals from I know who they bought from and you know what their genetics were and I can look back and you know we wonder well God how did he get it who did he buy it from well five years will go by and everybody he sources animals from are still healthy herds you know we're not seeing to where it's been moved now we have had a few instances where we can see some inter intrastate movement I only know of one instance where I believe there was interstate movement from Pennsylvania over to Ohio, but even there, the epi doesn't show it because they didn't find any positive animals in the ones that were left alive, you know. But uh, so I'm not saying we can't do it. I'm not, you know, but I am saying the program is working better than we think it is or better than it's made out to be. Um, it, it is a lot like a prostate or breast cancer screening, though. It doesn't prevent cancer. So it's something you got to remember. The, the certification program does not prevent me from getting this disease. That's why we got to do all these other mitigation factors. But uh, it has, though, in 20 years, you know, that and it hasn't been the federal, been a lot of state programs previous to that, has kept us from bouncing this thing all over heck. You know, and, and like I said, if you want, pick out a dot now. You know, we can discuss it and find out where they got their animals from and, and that their animals are still clean. So um, the other part of this, too, we heard yesterday about the IHC test is possibly missing 35%. I don't like that from a from an industry standpoint. I'm going to push for our industry to switch to RT quick, switch to a more sensitive test. At the same point, just like with TB testing, we had a TB test that was only worth only was caught like 60%. We got rid of it. We went to a, a blood test now that's at like 99.8 or something. But for years, it still worked because we did whole herd testing. They wouldn't let us use that poor test for individual animal. And for those of you that were at the Denver meeting and that, and you remember why and how we set up this program originally, it's based on time. It's not a one and done. We can't just test once and then, or once every three years, five years, whatever. We must test nonstop. We don't ever get to quit. So, you know, if my test did miss one, if the IEC did miss one, you know, I'm 19 years now testing, it's going to surface. It's just going to come up. This is a disease. That's sad to say. I mean, it's a bad disease and we, it, that it is real. And you, it's not, you can't hide it. You can't keep it swept under the rug because it's going to blow up in your herd and it's going to get, you know, go crazy. And the neat thing about that, though, is only 85 herds out of the 7,000 and some, whatever, you know. So, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's definitely something we want to work with. But, and we do take serious. Industry perspective, uh, you know, where does CWD compare to EHD, blue tongue, anthrax, TB? 
um, right here in, in Michigan, you know, TB in deer is, is a very significant thing. Anthrax, you know, we've lost deer and elk to that, and I know in the Dakotas and uh, down in Texas. You know, the, the industry takes CWD serious, but it's really hard to get them to, to say this is the most important thing that's ever going to happen to them when they've never had one, but they got a pile of deer that tall. You know, they've lost 80% of, of their herd in a matter of days to EHD. EHD is whacking us right now. Michigan, Central Michigan's getting hit by EHD. I just I don't know why it was it several years ago I did that. Uh, why Central Michigan? You know, this is weird how it jumps over. But right now, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, Ohio, cattle in Ohio, and that's the thing that's about these last few outbreaks. And I think this new EHD six, the cattle industry is starting to take a hit. Out in the Dakotas, we took a pretty good hit. So I was always hoping that would wake the cattle industry up and we'd work more on a vaccine because I still believe the cattle are the reservoir host to that and uh, that would actually help our wild deer at the same time. We don't need to vaccinate the deer, we need to vaccinate the cattle. But, so anyway, it's just to put it in perspective, you know, the it, it, it's tough to, like you say, to, to get people to tell a guy that like you said that just lost all his deer, he's sitting there with 80% of them and say, well, yeah, don't forget to take your, your CWD test. You know, at that point, he's throwing his hands up in the air. So um, we just got to keep it in perspective, you know, that uh, there's a lot of diseases out there. The human health risk thing, um, you know, there's many zoonotic diseases. Uh, we mentioned TB in, in, in deer right here in Michigan. You know, TB is a zoonotic disease. That's very, very real. People are still hunting deer, you know, hopefully they're not eating the ones that have the uh, TB lesions in it, you know. Um, good practice not to eat any sick animal. I stand by what the CDC said. Uh, you know, I'd like to see him add something in there about people not to eat macaque monkeys as well. But uh, <laughs> on a more serious note, though, uh, Dr. Hoover's statement yesterday about uh, BSC and, 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 and CJD, the variant CJD, you know, he's, he said that we're far distant from Holstein cattle or whatever, from cattle, than, than we are, you know, than, than what they talk about all this, yeah, we're closer to a macaque monkey, whatever. And where the relevance of that comes in at is, even within the deer species, fallow deer right now are showing to be immune to, not just resistant, but immune so far to, to CWD. Well, that fallow deer is a whole lot more related to an elk or a whitetail or a mule deer than a macaque monkey is, yet they don't get disease. Um, humans ourselves, 50 plus years of this, you know, being out in the landscape, thousands, thousands of deer and elk, CWD positive animals have been eaten. When, when you have a 50% infection rate in these herds, every other one, we know they're not testing them, they're taking them home and eating them. And we don't have human disease yet. So I'm not, not advocating for people to eat them. I'm just saying, you know, let's keep this in perspective, is that macaque monkey study should make us all nervous, but we still do have, let's not forget our history and all the, you know, how long CWD truly has been in the landscape. One that I am scared about is this, this pig studies that are coming out and what's going to happen now after it goes a few generations through some of these wild boar and wild swine and people eating those. I'd be more, far more nervous about that and that's something that the wildlife community needs to look at uh, because that, that's real. You know, these, seed, these, these wild pigs, or pigs can carry CWD, shed it, get it in their lymph, lymph node systems. Um, what happens when it passes through another host? You know, that's that's a question that we truly need to keep in perspective. Some of the needs our industry has. Where am I at for time here anyway? Uh, hey, that's sweet. I'll, I'll make some stuff up if I have to. Anyway, so I think I'm getting towards the end. Tools for uh, some of our needs. Tools for environmental detection, you know, New producers getting into the business, uh, producers that had a positive, can we go in and test their facilities to see are they allowed to get back in, can they stay in business, do they have a heavy load, whatever. Um, we, you know, we need something to get further into that. Uh, you know, the impacts on host populations. You know, we've talked about leaving some of these hunt ranches now in business. That's kind of a new practice that we've just started, you know, and actually Colorado's been doing it for forever. You know, Colorado uh, hasn't depopulated in years on these hunting ranches. and um, you know, when you're in an endemic area, does it make any difference? I know some of them have some rules we got to look at as long as your prevalence doesn't get higher than what it is on the outside, you know. So, but it's options we need to look at. Alternative intervention tools, you know. Uh, sustainable long-term view, you know. I think we need to talk about CWD, where it is, why it is, is it, you know. Our goal, hopefully, I think our goal to eliminate it, well, I tell you, unless it's in a new herd or a new area where we just find it, I, you know, yes, we can. but. 
I know Pennsylvania has really been hammering on this, and I sit and I look at that border with Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland that have had it for so many years, and, and Pennsylvania itself now has had it for so many years. You know, it's, uh, sometimes I think the thought of, of wiping it out isn't, isn't possible. I think that's where we need to get into, and I think we heard earlier today about, uh, you know, adjusting our levels, whatever, you know, and our, so there's, there's other things we need, to, we can do. So research of genetic resistance for CWD. Uh, I'll bring a picture up here earlier, but it is something the industry is working hard on. I can tell you, I, I do agree. Why aren't they more prevalent in the in the world? You know, there definitely has got to be something to that. As an industry, though, and and like I say, we do have a, a very heavy uh, DNA database. You know, what I'm hoping is if there is a deficiency, there's problems because the last thing we're going to do is breed animals because I can't make a living with animals that are substandard, you know. But I'm hoping that we can identify in that group, hopefully of resistant animals, better animals, and that we can work with that. That's something that the industry can do. It doesn't really help the wildlife side of it, uh, other than I guess if we can get to where we're, we, we can remove us from part of the equation, that'd be a win-win for everybody. So it's something we're working hard on. Research and the potential role small mammals play. I talked about that earlier with these voles. You know, and I don't know, back to my picture of my daughter there, but, and, I'm mad I didn't take a bunch of pictures this year when we were making hay, but how many of you have bailed or, or, or cut hay and have watched the seagulls follow you all day long? And yeah, is, isn't it crazy? What are they doing? They're swooping down and eating the voles and eating the mice. And you see, I mean, the frogs, whatever, huge, it's just unreal the things they eat and how big they can eat them. But the numbers of voles and, and mice and rodents that are out in these fields and that are getting bailed up into that hay, I don't know how you can quantify it. I mean, it's unreal. But I can tell you there's hundreds of seagulls getting a heck of a meal. You know, and I don't think they're getting all of them. So I, I think that really needs to be looked at. Uh, earlier we heard about the crows and the, and the coyotes. A big thing there, um, yeah, they do, we do have troubles with birds in our feeders. That is a huge, a huge issue with the industry and something we're working on. Birds do come in and mess up with our feeders bad. I feed strictly a pellet. I know some people feed a textured feed. Uh, I feed a pellet for the purpose of trying to deter birds from coming to my feeders because they can make a mess and they crap all over everything. So you, you never know where that crow or raven ate its last meal, you know, and the first thing they do is eat the eyeballs and then they switch to the opposite end and they start working their way in from there, you know, right in that lymph system that we're testing here in the rectal mucosa. I mean, they're gobbling it up. So some uh, research that we are working on, this is actually at my place. Uh, I did have the first herd that was ever live tested. Uh, we did rectal biopsies, drew blood, did nasal swabs. Uh, nasal swabs didn't work so well, but and, and blood they're still working on. But the rectal biopsies worked great. We didn't do tonsils at the time because um, we didn't want any possible cross-contamination. Used individual tools for everything. But uh, research is a huge thing. I mean, that's something we got to look at. It's something that, uh, you know, I think and yesterday we heard about the dollars. I remember when there used to be $19 million in this program. I mean, everybody. We used to go to USAHA, and they were talking about CWD in the chicken meetings. You know, I mean, everybody wanted to talk about CWD because everybody wanted to dip into that $19 million. So um, when, it, when the money ran out in 2011, we were in a tough spot as an industry because we didn't have the program yet that we'd been working on for all those years, John and I, and, and, you know, it was frustrating, but the industry went back to the hill and we were able to get, we were able to secure $3 million. And while that didn't help out the wildlife side of it, because half of that 19 million, used to, as, we, as we know, used to go to the wildlife for surveillance, but it did get us our program back and it did get our surveillance going, you know, and it did allow for some money that went, Dr. Nichols for research when she was with Wildlife Services because USDA can fund research through Wildlife Services. So, you know, we did get three million and this past year, two years now, because I guess we haven't got the 18 budget yet, just to work on that, but the, the language in there gives us a, another half million dollar bump up, you know, so it's 3.5. You know, in the grand scheme of things and your budgets and that, I know that that ain't squat. But when you go from three million to 3.5, I mean, it's a lot in this economy when everybody else's budgets were getting slashed. I would challenge my, my partners on the wildlife side of this, you know, with the QDMA, the NDA, and um, the other like organizations. 
we need to get together. We've talked about it forever, but we've never done it. You know, we're not a member of the CWD Alliance. You know, why, why not? You know, the, the, the deer industry, Nadifa, North American Deer Farmers should be a member of that. We should be going to the hill together because I think together we'd have a stronger message and we could, you know, so we're not going to be playing one side against the other. And, and you know, getting 10 million should not be an issue. And I tell you what, 10 million would get some, would, I think would spark some interest, you know, in, in, in research for CWD again. So um, I challenge my, my partners there to, to hey, let's just sit down and talk and let's try to go to the hill together. There's, there's many common things that we have. Um, means I made it through my slides. I'm a quick whip through my cheat notes I made this morning here. Uh, double fencing, lots of huge issue in some states. And it was nice to hear the, the speaker yesterday talk about frequency dependency. You know, that picture we've seen with them, two deer sticking their nose through the fence. Is that truly enough to pass disease? You know, and I don't believe it is. The neat thing about it is we, uh, Dr. Kurt Ricotter has got some great studies on electric fence. And I, th I really think the industry, I've been pushing this hard, everybody should have at least an electric fence around your, your, your perimeter. Why not? You know, yeah, it's cheap. Translocation of wildlife. You know, why are we still continue bouncing? And I think John tried to hit on this yesterday. He doesn't want movement of any live deer. And that includes, you know, and, and I respect John's opinion. And, and uh, but part of what he was saying is, is the movement of, of this translocation of wildlife. We're bouncing elk all over this country. We're not moving whitetails anymore, so somehow they think that's okay. But um, we do move elk. You know, we're, move, we're there's many instances where we're moving elk. As a sportsman, honestly, I like any new opportunity I can get. You know, so I'm not fighting that one. But what I am advocating for is more tools. Let's use the tools we have. The rectal biopsy, the tonsil biopsies don't work as well. And even, I guess, rectals aren't the best thing in the, in the world on elk either. But Dr. Haley's study we've shown in Colorado is they do work. You know, it, it, has, it does have some level of confidence, a lot more than doing nothing. So uh, I think translocation wildlife, you know, as a producer, somebody dumping 100 head of elk in my backyard, I mean, that's, that's a tough issue to, or a tough pill to swallow. Um, some of the genetic stuff I mentioned earlier, uh, when Nick is doing this genetic stuff, I found it interesting. And he showed the uh, resistance for the B or the variant Crutzfeld Jakob. And I'm, those of you that have known me for a long time know that in 1987, 1988, while stationed in Germany, the U.S. Army fed us a lot of UK beef. When I was discharged in 1991 after the Persian Gulf, there, uh, I received a letter from the Department of Health telling me I am no longer allowed to donate blood. So. I'm gonna work with Dr. Haley to find out if I'm a 129M or a 129V, but <laughs> something I'd never thought of before, but it's got my attention. Uh, part of this program that we've been working with Dr. Nichols on here and, and why we need these new program standards so bad, and it's frustrating that we work on something for years and they just can't get it to us. And I totally understand that there was an election last year and we had a new administration and things change and nothing can move until the new Ag Secretary gets appointed and, you know, but he's in there now and things are sitting there and, and it's up in that clearance process. It's in no man's land right now. USDA has, has no bearing or touch on it. So we need push from outside entity. And you know, many things in that the program standards help protect all of us. And um, a big issue for the industry is when we do have a positive and they do a trace out. If I sell an animal, and we have this situation going on right now in Pennsylvania, an individual sold an animal 48 months ago. And that animal now in this latest farm that came up positive with the 37 positives, one of those was his that he sold there 37 months ago, or excuse me, 48 months ago. 48 months ago, he sold an animal, and now it comes up positive. It's positive in the lymph nodes only. It's not positive in the obex. It hasn't made it to the brain. Our epis in here tell me now, is that the source animal for the disease into that herd, or is it a victim? So right now, that individual is quarantined. He cannot, he's locked down. He can't sell. He has livelihood basically shut down. They're telling him he's got to hold off for a whole nother year, which loses this year's sales plus we'll bypass next year's sales. So he's gonna lose two years worth of income. It gets worse than that. Every deer that he has sold off his farm from the time in the last 48 months, they've traced out to the other farms and all those people are locked down and can't sell unless they kill that animal, sacrifice the animal they bought from him with no indemnification. So it's either ride it out for a year or kill your animal, you know, sacrifice the animal. And 
you know, the new program standards will alleviate that. The new program standards have um, better language for the using indemnity, better language for using live testing. It gives us, uh, the state of Texas has done tremendous work with rectal biopsies and tonsil biopsies. And, you know, it's something that the industry and, and the wildlife agencies need to take a look at. The wildlife agencies really truly have been using tonsil biopsies, or at least the wildlife researchers have used them for a lot of years. So it, it works, works very well. Um, earlier we talked about, yeah, we seen the picture of the, the deer that is dumped out there. We got to figure out something with that. But the, the flip side of that, we have issues with, and I don't know what your wildlife agency does. Does, does Michigan Wildlife, do they collect? Do they have dumpsters out, car, you know, for people to put carcasses in? Where are they at? Check stations? Okay, because we have issues in some other states where I've had some deer farmers, they put a dumpster at the end of his driveway. So now you, you, your livelihood's sitting there, you know, you got 100, 200 deer behind fence, you know, that your, your livestock, your property, and the DNR comes along and puts a dumpster a half mile down the road. And that, that people bring carcasses from all over and throw in there. And then the crows are in there eating in that dumpster and then coming over, fill, you know, crapping their feeder. It's something we need to work on. I mean, we gotta work together on this. We gotta address all the issues. I, I like the idea of collection stations, but we just gotta be conscious of where we put them. Um, with that, I guess I am going to, uh, I think, finish up here. One thing I want to say is uh, animal agriculture impacts a lot of wildlife, a lot of different things, you know, and we can't safeguard against everything. We do the best we can. You know, the farmers, the ranchers, whether we raise deer or not, we don't intend to hurt the wildlife. We want to live in harmony with them. All I don't know a farmer rancher that's not a sportsman. You know, I'm sure there's some, but just like there's people who work in town that aren't sportsmen. You know, but for the most of us, uh, we are. You know, and you know, but but it does happen. I wasn't able to find that one in time. You know, but even this one over here that I did, it, it didn't make it. You know, so uh, Mother Nature is cruel. And that's reality. You know, so we do the best we can. And I think we need to put things in perspective. Deer are going to die. Um, we got to do our best to safeguard to prevent it. You know, and that's you know, so. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you inviting me to come and speak here. Thank you.